Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon. John Suntress here. I'm getting ready for Rose City in Portland this weekend. Can't wait to see everybody. I hope to uh, say hello to you if you're going to the con. A couple show notes. I know commercials can be annoying. Uh, please listen to the commercials at the beginning of Word Balloon if when you download them you hear them or if when you're playing them live. That's how I get paid. One of the ways I get paid. I don't get paid if you fast forward through the commercials. And uh, there's a portion of the audience that does fast forward. So please uh, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's only 90 seconds to two minutes of commercials before we get to the meat of the show. I really appreciate it. I also have a YouTube channel under the name of Word Balloon. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. I'm trying to get to at least 1,000 subscribers. I'd like to put more video content up there. There's already dozens of files at YouTube. Uh, again, it's under Word Balloon. Questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. Okay, almost set to go. One more commercial, and then it's off to Word Balloon. Thanks a lot for listening. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, really excited about today's show. Jennifer DeRoss is joining us. Who's Jennifer DeRoss? She has just written an incredible biography of Gardner Fox. You might have heard the name. Gardner Fox is a very important creator, writer from uh, both the Golden Age and the Silver Age. His career lasted until the late 70s as far as comic books go, but he got into gaming. He wrote novels all through the years. In fact, uh, there's uh, one of the most consistently employed writers despite all the tosses and turns of the comic book industry uh, in the 40s and in the 50s. And Gardner Fox always found employment and found a way to make money as a writer. Really interesting story. He started off as a lawyer. Of course, uh, if you don't know, Gardner Fox uh, created the, build bone, uh, the, the building blocks of the original crossover. I mean, he did All-Star Comics number three, the first issue of the Justice Society together, and wrote many of those Justice Society stories. He also graduated to Justice League stories. Not really graduate, but, you know, uh, when they brought the Justice League back, or as a new thing, one of the first things they did was the uh, JLA-JSA crossover. It started with The Flash of Two Worlds, the Barry Allen-J. Gar- Garrick uh, story that told us about Earth-1 and Earth-2, and then obviously followed with uh, the annual Justice League Justice Society team-ups. All this was covered uh, in uh, the 60s and really well into the 70s, into the 80s, but Gardner Fox was a very important uh, part of those initial years of doing the JLA-JSA crossovers. Very interesting career. Happy to talk to Jennifer about her new book and tell you about it as well. I think you're going to enjoy today's Word Balloon. It's all brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your great support via Patreon. Uh, as I always say, Word Balloon is free, but you want to help out the cause, you can do that by subscribing to Word Balloon via Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or click on the ad on the front page of wordballoon.com, the Patreon ad, and it'll take you right to my Patreon page. Thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. They're having a great year here in 2019. They're calling it the year of reading dangerously, and why not? Unbelievable books from great creators. Chris Sabella's new Trust Fall. You got uh, Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly doing Stronghold. Dark Red from Tim Seeley. Uh, Night Temporal from Cullen Bunn. Just to name a few, Matthew Clickstein's You Are Obsolete. Lots of great car- uh, creators to go alongside things like Jimmy's Bastards from Garth Ennis and Marguerite Bennett's Animosity. Great genre bending stuff from Aftershock Comics. In the days and weeks ahead, we'll be talking to more Aftershock creators about their books, but you don't have to wait. You can go to their website, you'll find story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at aftershockcomics.com. All right, without further ado, let's talk about Gardner Fox with Jennifer DeRoss on Word Balloon. Jennifer DeRoss, welcome to Word Balloon. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Hey, uh, great subject. I am a I am a huge Gardner Fox fan. I am very fortunate to have grown up in the early 70s when they were reprinting so many of his Justice uh, League and Justice Society crossovers, and also a lot of his original Justice Society stories, too. So I, I was kind of hip to uh, the greatness of Gardner Fox. But I, I agree with your premise. I wonder how many people south of, God, I mean, I'm 54, let's say south of 50, really you know, know a lot about Gardner Fox. And I don't, I don't claim to know a lot about Gardner Fox. Well, even even if they know a lot of his writing, his story is still largely untold. Absolutely, yeah, that's cool. And yes, obviously, it's a combination of his work and his and his biography. What what uh, what drew you to this subject? 
Well, it, it all started, uh, I was doing archival work at the writing center that I was working at, and then I got into the grad program at U of O. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I focused on in my master's was the modern American superhero. And when I saw that there was a class on, arch- on uh, 19th century archives, I approached the teacher and asked her if I could work on the Gardner Fox collection because I knew that his materials were there at the University of Oregon, and she approved it, and it just kind of took off from there. The more I worked with the materials, the more I felt impassioned about bringing his story forward because people don't talk about him the way that they talk about a lot of the other writers from the era, and it just it feels important and it feels relevant too. A lot of the subjects are, are things that we're still talking about. Absolutely, yes, and I want you to go into that. But let's start and uh, you know give my my younger listeners a little primer. I'm sure I said something in the intro, but how would you? If someone asked you, you know, to do the elevator pitch on who is Gardner Fox, what would you say? I would say Gardner Fox is a quiet, idealistic man who loved writing superheroes and pulps and is foundational to much of what we know of the comic industry as it is today. I mean, at the very least, you know, he's co-creator of The Flash, which is arguably the fourth pillar of DC. He gave Batman the Batarang. His influences are everywhere. Yep. And, and his name should be, you know, well-known among everybody. That's awesome. And, yeah, I agree. And also, you know, especially given the victory lap that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is doing with Endgame, it's like you got to go back. To, mm-hmm. Did did Gardner Fox write that very first Justice Society uh, team-up issue in All-Star 3? Yes, he did. We have him to thank for Avengers. <laughs> exactly. No, for real. Absolutely, man. And I, and it's fair to make that connection. Um, you know, there's the apro- apocryphal story that supposedly um, Martin Goodman and um, Harry Donafield were having a golf game, you know, and supposedly, oh, this Justice League is really working for us. And that was supposedly <laughs> impetus for, you know, Martin Goodman to go to Stan Lee and say, hey, maybe we should go back to superheroes or something. But the the reality is, like you say, I mean, it's uh, or confirm that yeah, Gardner Fox created the Justice Society and took all those great heroes uh, and and put them together on the same team. But like you said, even before that, he created the Flash. And let's go even further back and tell me about uh, because, as I understand it from reading the material you you provided me with, he was a lawyer. So what got him into writing? Mm-hmm. And he started writing in the pulps pre comics, obviously. But yeah, what got him into writing the pulps? Actually, he he didn't quite start in the pulps. The pulps was something that came later. Um, He started writing comics before Superman even came out because he was friends with Vincent Sullivan. They had gone to, like, elementary school together even. And so Vincent Sullivan was already in the comic industry, and he would run into Gardner Fox here and there, and he remembered that Gardner Fox really enjoyed writing. So he invited him to write comics for him. And I I have to say, one of my favorite little sound bites that I found was his response to that is what are comics? That's, (laughs) that's how early the industry was. Sure. Absolutely. (laughs) Um, That's amazing. And so he he started writing, huh? No, no, continue. I'm sorry. I was just saying, wow, that's incredible. But please continue. (laughs) I know. Um, But he he started out with a a short prose story under the the name uh, Paul Dean, which is a pseudonym that both he and Vince Sullivan shared. And then he broke into Zaytara, and and the career just kind of started from there. Um, He was happy working as a lawyer, I would say. Like, he certainly seemed to to show some pride in that. Um, But in the end... I think that he enjoyed writing comics more, and I think that it was something he was more passionate about. Interesting. And, I mean, also to uh, – I mean, it, it is interesting that he – yeah, he kind of gave up the law career and, and went full force into comics. And um, you, when we say he created The Flash, we're talking about Jay Garrick, the Golden Age Flash, obviously. Yes. Well, that's yes. – that, to be honest, my favorite Flash always has been um, – and, Me too. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, you know, I'm Greek, so the, the Mercury helmet certainly uh, didn't hurt. But I just, I loved his constant... Well, the Mercury helmet mixed with the, it's also a nod to uh, the World War One helmet as well. Absolutely, yeah, Doughboy helmet, you're right about that. Good call. 
Um, I didn't even like think about that. So you know, in creating the Flash, um, was it? Uh, tell me who was the who was the artist that co-created the Flash? Oh goodness gracious! I think it was Lambert. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think it might be Harry Lambert. Yeah, off the top of my head, <laughs> he is one of those classic Flash uh, artists and everything. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, I think when you think of the face of the of Jay Garrick and stuff, it's definitely a Harry Lambert face. That's cool. Yeah, you're right. Um, no, that's neat. So, so Sullivan was working for um, you know back then DC was kind of two two like concurrent publishers, All American and National. Am I right? So and 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 uh, Gardner working for the, with the Flash, um, and and even the Justice Society really in general. Those are really all the heroes that were under the All American banner. Mm hmm. Okay. And uh, but he he spread out. He worked for just about everybody. Did he? Did he work for other publishers? I mean, as you say, and we can talk about what he did for Batman. But did he work for the other publishers of the day? He did. Um, he started out. He moved to. Um, Goodness gracious, Columbia, I think it was. And um, see, I just got back from camping, so I'm a little tired. <laughs> 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 it's all right. Um, but uh, he basically just followed around Vincent Sullivan. Okay. Uh, so he so he started several smaller companies. Um, uh, let's see, I can. A lot of work kind of fly by night and didn't last very long and stuff. Certainly in that early period. It's true. It's true, which is kind of one of those things. But I, I think it is worthwhile remembering that because, oh, yeah. yes, it was Columbia, and then I'm try I'm blanking on the second one for some reason. Magazine Enterprises. That's it. Oh, okay. Um, well, that was was that Martin Goodman's company? No, that was I mean, Vincent Sullivan's. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I, I didn't. Re oh, and uh, as you said, excuse me, that Vincent obviously created the uh, Vince Vince Sullivan, as he's known. Uh, was yeah he created those uh, those publishing companies okay because yeah I thought um, I know Timely was the name of of Marvel did he do yeah. any Marvel work in, I know he did in the in the sixties and seventies but did he uh, in the yeah well, later on after he was you know quote unquote pushed out of DC um, he did work for Marvel and he did not publish anything although I think back when it was called Atlas they they did reprint some Ghost Rider stuff so. Oh. Kind of, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say he, he did work for, for Marvel before that point. Wow, okay. I didn't even know that he worked on the 50s Ghost Rider. That's fantastic. I was yeah. love that character. <laughs> Neat character. Yeah, pretty pretty cool character that's slipped into public domain. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that was, yes. you know, pretty neat concept. And, uh, you know, they had him even in the uh, – I know they had him in the uh, Nicolas Cage movie represented. So, in fact, Yeah, I thought it was a nice nod. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, so Fox is, Fox is running comics. And um, that's interesting because, as you say, he was, was he a successful novelist? I know he, he ultimately started writing novels in the early 50s. Was that, you know, did it work for him? I mean, how many novels did he write? He wrote about 160 Damn. is the, the estimate. <laughs> Never mind. I guess he was successful. That's terrific. That's great. And were they in yeah, he, he lived. He wrote enough novels that he could live off of it after he stopped doing comics. He just wrote a novel a year, and that was enough off of royalties and everything else. Wow. That's fantastic. You know, God, and, and I'm sure you know as well, so many heartbreaking stories of Golden Age creators that, you know, their lives didn't end well. And uh, yeah. it's, it's nice that uh, Fox was such an exception and also recognized for his contributions, uh, yeah. you know, well into well into his senior years. So that's that's terrific, and um, yeah. So, I, I guess um, you know these are these are the building blocks of the original ideas for superheroes. What do you, what do you think he contributed uniquely that um, you know the Joe Simons, the Jack Kirby's, and, and others of that time weren't doing? I think that it, it was a big part of it was his humanitarian drive. He really seemed to care about social issues in a way that wasn't just you know coming from the war board. Um, just tracking through most of his characters were these idealistic, noble, like it felt like instruction manuals for young men on how to be a man. 
Um, that was one of the most common threads. But you can see, like, the way that his, his characters interact, friendship is really important to him. Um, a lot of it is, you know, people are people no matter where they're from or what they look like. A lot of, of moral lessons, I would say, are, are one of the things that pops out to me most about his writing that's unique. And as you say, he did. He, he took on social issues and and wanted to, you know, put them in the comics and stuff. And I think that's really forward thinking. It's just like I know Gene Yang just uh, did a, a, a new uh, adaptation of the Superman radio shows where the radio writer for yeah. Superman had him attack the Ku Klux Klan. And, you know, that's yeah, that's yeah, that's pretty bold. And, you're, and Fox kind of, uh, you know, traveled in the same uh, milieu. A little bit, yeah. I would say that a lot of it came from his Catholicism. He believed in uh, Vincentian leanings, and so that's all about service, and that that comes up often, especially if you look at the the way that his children turned out and the way that they've continued doing those those important forms of work. Um, it feels like that was one of the most important things to him. That's really cool, and I also know that um, national at least from a public relations standpoint, was trying to promote uh, good behavior. And, and, oh, yeah. you know, and the comics were a guide to you know, b- making better young men and young women and everything. Yeah. So it makes sense that he would obviously then you know, be a go-to guy uh, in their cause. That's, that's great. I, um, so, like you said, he wrote a lot of uh, Green Lantern as well, right, Alan Scott? He did. He, go, he went back and forth, um, him and John Brum. Cool. Yeah, John Broom. Now, isn't that interesting? You're right. And I don't know. I, I kind of think John Broom might be a little slightly better known, which is crazy because, again, <laughs> in that 70s period, like I said, they kept – they were reprinting all those team-ups of the Justice League and the Justice Society. And, I mean, we should – That's that's got to be a great story in your book as well when um, the, the notion of bringing all that back and everything um, – but uh, I was going to say that uh, those those early uh, Justice Society stories, um, they really seem to hit the button. As you say, he had social issues beyond the war effort, but this really was, I mean, they, they are really great examples of kind of putting out the positive war propaganda through a superhero mm-hmm. book during, during, you know, obviously World War II. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you had any comments on, you know, like some of the examples of some of the great stories that they, they did in the Justice Society like that. Oh, they, there were several. I mean, um, for instance, at one point he has the Justice Society raising money for war orphans. He has yep. st- a story about, you know, uh, well, it's not explicit, explicit, but the main overtone is um, fighting for disability rights. So veterans coming back from the war and we should be treating them kindly and, and, and things like that. Um, he, I mean, there, one of my favorite examples is when he has Hawkman go, I believe it was hungry and he helps the, uh, people with an underground newspaper and they, wow. it's, yeah. And, and it's literally power to the press, which is another thing that uh, Gardner Fox used to write for his college and high school newspapers. And he was an editor there too, um, for his college newspaper anyways. Um, and so you get to see this little bit of a, a power to the press sort of thing. And uh, along with that, I think one of the more important things that he was doing that doesn't get talked about enough is the way that he was including important information about the war and what was happening. And that's one of the only ways that children in the era were able to get that because parents didn't necessarily want their kids to be all involved and obsessed with the war, especially the, the more nitty gritty details. Sure. Wow, that's really cool. I didn't realize that. I remember one uh, interesting uh, Justice Society story where it involved what they called, I think, the Freedom Train. And it had all these um, great American artifacts on it. And it was kind of yeah. this, you know, whistle-stop kind of tour across the country where people could finally, like, see the Constitution or whatever was in there. Um, and I remember, that, you know, yeah, there being some sort of complication of... Uh, either the train getting hijacked or whatever. But, yeah, that was, you know, another great kind of just yay America kind of thing, again, in that war period of uh, just, yeah, a positive image of, of, 
you know, the American way, as Superman says. And uh, yeah, I thought that was I thought that was interesting, but it fit. I mean, the Justice Society seemed to be America's team, and and, and had it's that kind true. Of- Although I think he pushed back a, against that a little bit. Oh, there totally. were yeah. several moments where he he would talk more about brotherhood, and that you know it, it's all about freedom, and. Um, yeah, I, w- I would say global blo- brotherhood is one of the bigger overarching. He grew up, or he spent a lot of time. His wife was an Italian immigrant, or at least his, her oh, parents wow. were. Okay. Like he, he very much he grew up thinking that everybody should be treated the same. And so, yes, there's you know, yay America, but I think he worked very hard to try to not other as much as I'm with you. Yeah, as. Some. Well, and I, I, well, to be honest, I kind of think back then, yay, America meant inclusion, and it wasn't, and it wasn't the unfortunate, divisive thing that it is today. And so, (laughs) yeah, well, you know, what are you going to do? Well, important to to clarify today. (laughs) Yeah, no, and you're right; that's fair. I, I, you know, um, yeah, again, because I do think that a lot of that was just kind of born of everyone in comics seemed to be, or at least the majority of. The the classics. I mean, Simon and Kirby certainly felt that way. Uh, you can you can see that yeah. in their works. Um, yeah. yeah. I well, let's let's get back. You know what? What interested me about the Justice Society and the way that he would have the team work, and even later in the sixties as well, when when the crossovers would happen, was the team would get into little subgroups mm-hmm. of like two or three, and they would kind of attack a problem and stuff. And I um, well, that he he. It started out where it was just one character at a time, which I liked better because then you really get a chance to to learn more about the character. Sure. Um, which is, I mean, the point of the the series was to just kind of showcase these are all the characters. You want to know more? Go read their comics. Sure. Uh, which I really liked because you got to see the different artists. You got. I, I think that the compilation was one of the genius parts of that. Um, it wasn't until the Justice League that we started getting the, the team-ups, which okay. I, I think you got a little less chance for the, the individual heroes to shine, but I think it was interesting the way that he could play with the dynamics because of the team-ups, too. Yeah, and I, you're right. I totally forgot that a lot of those early stories really were like, okay, here's four pages of The Flash and then six pages yeah. of Green Lantern and the like. That's cool. So did he, in addition to writing Justice Society, and as we say, he wrote Flash, he wrote Green Lantern. I know um, the Hawkman series was in Flash comics. Um, yeah. You know, so did he write? Did he write more than just the lead feature? I mean, that's as as people may remember in seeing reprints of action comics and detective comics. Well, it even bled into uh, things like Flash and Green Lantern comics, where there were sub stories. You'd get like sixty four pages for ten cents, and there was, oh yeah, and so there was plenty of room for you know four or five different stories, at least if not more. So oh yeah, so did he write those? Uh, like sub features as well with Hawkman and the like. Did he? Did he? Was he involved in the creation of Hawkman as well? He was. He was. Uh, he was involved in. In fact, that was one of what I consider the breaking points where he had to choose comics or, or working as a lawyer because he was pushed too far at that point. I think. Um, so he wrote both the, the Hawkman and Flash, co-created both of them, wow. um, and then he also had several other pieces within it and because he is so well read he knows his literature he knows his mythology he knows all of that so the fact that there are mistakes like in like his mythological information he says that you know anubis is the hawk god but that's not correct (laughs) and has the head of a jackal, like it was just, it was too much all at the same time. But he wrote the the Flash, he wrote the Hawkman. There was a Cliff Cornwall story that was in there oh, sure. as well, and a prose story. Like that that first issue of Flash Comics is just, it's packed. It is concentrated Gardner Fox. I love uh, why they did the prose stories in the comics. And um, I'm sure you know it as well. Uh, if you do, I'll let you tell the story why why they had the two page pro stories in those. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, I just as I understood it, it, it then qualified as a magazine because of mm-hmm. the pros, and they got a cheaper postage rate for the people who were subscribing, and they you know so it made it more cost efficient for them to throw in two pages of text versus another couple pages of cartooning and everything. As I understand, <laughs> right. 
Yep, yep. And that's where he got his entry is the very first one that he wrote was a pro story. Oh, that's amazing. That's cool. Well, you know, that's as did Stan Lee. That was his first <laughs> thing was writing the two page pro story in a Captain America issue. Um, so let's we should list off what who are the other uh, characters that uh, Fox created that people may know or may not know. In comics. Oh, goodness. There are so many. Um, I would say another big one is Dr. Uh, Dr. Fate, sure. I would say, is a huge one. He had a hand in the creation of Sandman. And I'm, I'm always careful to say he had a hand in or contributed to because a lot of those, it's hard to pinpoint the exacts. But there's enough evidence to say that he was in the mix somehow. Wow. Um, so I, Starman is one of the ones. Um, the Atom in the Silver Age was one of the ones that he seemed to have a very strong, at the very least, he wrote that first issue. Wow. Okay. Um, I, I was going to assume it was Al Pratt, but you're, you're telling me Ray, the Ray Palmer Adam, the, yes. the the modern Adam. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. Um, he did uh, early Sandman, um, which that was an interesting, I, I did not know that he actually lived with Flessel before. Like that's, uh, that blew my mind before he t- went off to the, uh, to the war and, and all of that. They were roommates. Craig, Craig Flessel. And he was the artist, yeah. correct? Yes. Wow. That's Same amazing. Thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you know, and I'm doing it half for myself and also half for the, for the audience. And we, when we might drop a last name and not have the full name. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. And Jack Burnley, I want to say was the Starman artist. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. And again, this is Ted Knight star, man. Um, who God, uh, I, I don't know. Did you ever read uh, what James Robinson did with the whole Starman mythos in the, the 90s and 2000s? No, I didn't. I kind of stepped away from superhero comics a bit in the 90s. Um, I, I just it was very, very masculine. And I was I had gone off on a different kick where I had gotten more meta and interested in uh, cultural, like uh, mad, really changed my my perception. I uh, spy versus spy was explained to me the first time, and so I was kind of on this this other tangent where I was reading uh, Rocco's Modern Life and Ren and Stimpy and all of those sort of like playing with the culture itself. And so I, I stepped away from superhero comics for a bit. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, and I should ask you, yeah, tell me about tell me about what got you into comics and what what got you reading comics. I, comics have always been a part of my life. My grandma was a big comic reader, and she believed that every kid loves comics. And um, her favorite were newspaper strips. Sure. And she literally would she would cut them out because I, I lived out in the boonies, and so we couldn't get a newspaper out there. So she would cut out her favorite strips and she would mail them to me wow. so that I could read them. That's fantastic. Um, That's a good grandmother. My God. <laughs> She was pretty great. Um, and so she, she always made sure that I, I had lots of, of comics in my life. I genuinely don't remember the first comic book I read. <laughs> That's cool. All right. And then believe me, I also checked out a bit in the 90s and I only came back in the very late 90s and started reading again. Are you reading now? Do you read com- – and then obviously not just superheroes, but do you read comics now? I do. Um, I've been reading – goodness uh, – I've been thinking about trying to get back into web comics. I feel like there's something interesting there. Um, I, I would love to come up with some kind of a project to do with Hyperbole and a Half. I think she's doing really interesting things. Um, I just read... I'm going to mess up the title on this. It's not actually a comic, but it works with a comic. It was uh, Phantomus and the multinational vampires, a utopian something. Wow. <laughs> Very long. French comic. Yeah, from an right? Argentinian. Oh, it's Argentinian. Uh, oh, wow. Yes. I, I, I like, there's a few Argentinian comic. Uh, Borderline is genius. Etronaut is amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of all over the map when it comes to comics. <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a, I enjoy discovering international comics as well, uh, not only the South American comics, but also, you know, Belgian comics. and. Oh, yeah. Yeah, David B. is gorgeous. There you go. Absolutely. You know, and I, no, I, I'm with you. It's a bigger, it's a bigger world. My buddy, Augie DeBlake, he's a big Asterix uh, fan. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, no, I get it. And, and yeah, that's the great thing about comics. It really is worldwide and so many different uh, ways to tell stories. Um, well, back to Fox. Now, here's a guy who was thriving in the Golden Age, the 50s come, we get the the Wortham period, and really even just the post-war period, 
where comics change, the superheroes aren't as fun as they used to be. At least that's the the feeling from yeah. the, the audience and everything. But Gardner yeah. Fox survives and endures. He does. And he does that by moving to, to other genres. That's when he started doing a lot of Westerns. He started doing a lot of funny animals. Um, the Dodo and the Frog is great. I, I actually really enjoy that. Who, who um, published Dodo and Frog? Was that also national? I believe it was national, yeah. Okay. And yeah, did he, be, was it because of his relationship with Vin Sullivan that he did pretty much stay a national guy for as long as he did? Well, he was also really re- reliable. Um, the editors loved working with him because he took what they, they said, like he just did what they told him to do. Um, and he always, he would always come in prepared. He would know exactly how a story would end. He always came in with ideas. He always, always delivered. And if there wasn't, for instance, there was one day he, he told a story, he came in and, um, they didn't have a Superman comic. It didn't come through. And so they told him, Hey, can you do that? And he literally just sat down and wrote a Superman story. That's a, <laughs> yeah, I believe it. No, I totally believe it. Cause as prolific as he was, and that's the great thing. I'm really glad that you're doing this book because it really does kind of lay out all the different aspects of his career. Um, so again, you know, we should go back to Batman. So what, what were his contributions to, to Batman? I argue that the Gothic atmosphere really comes from, from Gardner Fox, I would. Uh, how early was it? How early things, were his stories? When did when you know like what what was it? Detective was it Batman? Do you know an issue? It number? was Detective. Okay. Um, I I think it was. I'm terrible with numbers. That's absolutely <laughs> stat that I should have somewhere. I've got a little list of of important things that I'm like I need to remember that specific. Thing, for instance, by his own records, Fox wrote four thousand two hundred and thirteen comic books, by, stories by uh, nineteen eighty, wow. like things like that. I'm not going to remember that. There's no way. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Good lord, you know, Jesus. <laughs> um, would you think was it in the? Warriors? It was the uh, yeah. third appearance of Batman. Was his first? So, Detective Comics number uh, twenty nine. Holy cow! That's fantastic. Yeah. Jeez. I didn't realize it was that early. I was assuming it maybe was after things were up and running and everything. Holy man. No, he was he was the first writer assigned to Batman. Wow. And how do you uh, do you know how like did he do a lot of Batman stories? He did a fair amount. I am I it, the the run that I focus on in the book is uh 29 to 34. Um, but there is, I think, room for argument that he wrote more for for Bob Kane and Bill Finger than we currently know. Um, it's hard to pinpoint that because of the way that the the issues and the covers and the, like all the stories get mixed up. For instance, the theory is, and and I I don't see any strong evidence to counter the the common belief that Bill Finger wrote the the short little two page origin and then Fox wrote the rest of the issue because they are very tonally different. Yeah, um and, yeah. yeah, but I I think that there's enough room for argument that Gardner Fox was more of a ghost writer than we we know. Interesting. Or we have evidence for. Yeah. Uh, but even just looking at that run from uh, 29 to 34, we get the first arch criminal. We get the uh, development of a girlfriend. Julie, we get the yeah. battering. We get the gothic atmosphere. We get a vigilante attitude coming through stronger. Um, Gardner Fox is one of the ones that gives Batman a gun. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is, you know, still a big controversial thing. Sure. Um, and he, it, there was a little bit of trouble that they got into there because of the fact that, you know, they were trying to be more, more child friendly. Sure. Absolutely. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that he gave him, what the character was the lab where Batman develops all of his gadgets and gear. And we see all those gadgets and gear coming like for the suction cups so he can crawl out uh, the windows and things <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. that I think that's such a core part of, of who Batman is. He's got a gadget for everything. Absolutely. And that was Gardner Fox. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. That's great. So are those early, um, God, the case of the chemical syndicate or the, uh, <laughs> was that one of Gardner's uh, stories? I don't remember off okay. the top of my head. Because, you know, I, well, I just know, like, Matt Wagner, 
the great creator who uh, has done a ton of Batman stuff and also his char- his own character, Grendel, he rewrote a lot of those early detective stories and fleshed mm-hmm. them out. Just a couple of years ago, well, God, now it's probably been about 10 or 15 years ago. But um, I thought that was pretty neat. And yeah, he went back in the same way that... Um, uh, well, again, it was Matt Wagner who did, they, he did the same thing with the early Sandman stories, and when he did Sandman yeah. Mystery Theater in the '90s, a lot of yeah. them really were adaptations of those original eight-page stories or ten-page stories. But you know, he'd flesh them out into a four-issue arc, and you know, did mm-hmm. that. So yeah, I was I was just wondering. No, that's that's cool. So all right, let's go back to the timeline. So in the '50s, he starts writing novels as well, and. Um, you know, as you said, he, he uh, and again in this period as as well. I'm assuming in the well, obviously his novels had to have been other genres. What were some of the genres of novels in those hundred plus uh, novels that he wrote? Probably everything, I'm guessing. A little bit of everything, yeah. Um, I would say he's probably most known for his fantasy novels. He didn't really start that until later on after he, you know, officially retired. Um, okay. But at the time, he was writing a lot of uh, historical fiction was his favorite. Cool. Uh, and and some of them were, you know, a little saucy, I would say. Uh, he, 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 I would, there, yeah, some of them are soft porn, just straight up soft porn. Hilarious. Gil- wow. Once described as, as <laughs> upper class bodice rippers. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I didn't realize that's crazy. It's like learning that Joe Schuster drew... S&M comics because, you know, again, it was a gig and it's like, all right. And I mean, he knew only how to draw draw faces a certain way. So there's Lois Clark and Lex Luthor. It's like, all right, so so be it. Um, But no, that's that's really interesting. And, you know, again, he is of that generation, um, even though, as you say, he started in comics before he started in the pulps, where writers really were jacks of all trades. And they really did have to, like, adapt and be able to write a romance uh, story as easily as a buccaneer story or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, most of the greats did. Yes. Yeah. That's cool. His was, um, did he do any significant pulp work? Like, uh, a guy like, um, and I was Walter Gibson with the shadow or, you know, um, Lester Dent and those who uh, wrote doc Savage. Um, I wouldn't say that his, his pulp work is well known on its own. It's pretty imitative. I mean, they're fun. They're sure. a lot of fun. That's the way cool. that, that pulp can be, you know, um, but he, there's definitely a lasting legacy for his, uh, Kothar novels because, uh, Gygax, Gary Gygax of, uh, Dragon or uh, Dungeons Dragons was a fan of Gardner Fox, and so that's where the idea of the the Lich King came from. Was that first Gardner Fox book where he or the uh, first Kothar book where Gardner Fox has an undead wizard give the main character this magical sword, and Gygax was like, "Oh, that's a good idea," and ran with it. And there's actually a lot of of connection between. Gardner Fox and the Dungeons and Dragons development. Uh, he used to write short stories for uh, the Dragon, which is the the I, I guess pulp magazine type thing that would supplement the the books sure. that would come out. Yeah. Um, like, and uh, he even made his own board game. <laughs> yeah, talk about that. I, I found that really interesting in your introduction. Please, yeah, they explained that. But when we'll get back to comics, but I agree with you. I don't think that that's terrific to learn. And I and I don't know how many gamer people know Gardner Fox the way Gygax did. But yeah, tell tell us about uh, tell us about his board game. So uh, Warlocks and Warriors is this really cool. It, it, what I enjoy about it from a scholarly perspective is just how much it allows you to step inside of a Gardner Fox story. So it's essentially a roll the dice and move, but then you go on to a special space and then you roll the dice and it tells you what happens in that location. So for instance, there's a maze and a dragon's cave and things like that. And so they'll give a readout and that allows you to essentially develop a story for the character as you're moving around. Um, it, it's, I think, a lot of fun. Um, me and my boys have played it a few times. My youngest really, really enjoys it. That's, well, that's, and isn't it interesting that, you know, because he did this like early 80s, I'm assuming, or late 70s? 
Um, that came out in, uh, that one I do have somewhere. Oh, maybe I don't. I it, was, it was, it was 70s. Oh, it was 70s. Sure. Okay, so yeah, God, look at that, man. You know, almost. Yeah, 77. 77, holy cow. So yeah, like, you know, uh, 45 years later and everything, this is uh, still relating to people. And again, that shows you the strength of his writing. That's really cool. I, uh, I want to get back to the, you know, and, and jump down to the 60s because how, uh, you know, uh, when the superhero craze, I mean, Showcase 4 happened, did he have a hand in creating Barry Allen? He did not, um, okay. but he did write a lot of Barry Allen later on. Okay. Did, but he did bring, um, he did reinvent Hawkman. Oh, that's Hawkman. excellent. Yeah. Now, before we get to that, because that's great, and I imagine, again, as you said, Ray Palmer as well, that he was clearly a go-to guy for Julie Schwartz in terms of yeah. when they were reinventing the, the, the superhero line. Did he yes, write? Yes, I met every week. <laughs> I believe it. Well, there you go. Did he write Flash of Two Worlds, the infamous? He did. All right, so there you go. That's where the first, you know, real generational crossover happens where, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Barry, Barry. He brought the multiverse into DC Comics, and interestingly, he brought himself into comics, and I do talk about, you know, Gardner Fox, the character, too. Oh, that's interesting. Is, was he a character on Earth Prime? Yeah, essentially, uh, Gardner Fox is a writer within the the DC universe. Um, essentially, what it is is Golden Age comics are in world media. Yes, yeah, <laughs> for, for the Silver Age. Right, this <laughs> Showcase Four. Barry Allen is reading a Jay Garrick comic. Exactly, exactly. And so Gardner Fox was able to write himself in because he wrote those <laughs> comics, and those comics exist in the universe. <laughs> That's cool. I'm sure you know in the 70s that The Flash did travel to what was supposed to be our Earth, Earth Prime, as they call yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah. And, you know, and Elliot Magan and Carrie Bates and, of course, Julie Schwartz were all characters in The Flash and in Justice League and stuff. So, yeah, I didn't know if – and also, I guess, um, Jim Apparel, I know, makes an appearance in a – in a Batman uh, book in the same way, where you see him at his uh, uh, drafting table and that. So that's great. That's fantastic. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that obviously leads to, you know, the, the Flash of Two Worlds leads to mm -hmm. uh, Crisis on Earth 2. Is that what the, what yep. the first and he wrote the first Crisis. Yeah, yeah, that's, and like I said, no, this was like, you know, event, he, it really was kind of the first event comic. Yeah. That's pretty amazing, yeah. And uh, just the idea that they were yearly. Um, well, in between, was he then writing for Hawkman and, um, you know, uh, The Atom and stuff? Let's talk about Hawkman. I mean, my God, they're, him and um, Joe Kubert. Good Lord. And I know, oh, I know. And I know Joe Kubert has a history with Hawkman going back to the Golden Age. You know, I met him. I don't, did you ever have a chance to meet Kubert? No. You know, he, I wish. Oh, God. You know, and seriously. I, <laughs> I know people who have met him. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I feel real fortunate having met him. And I, and I wanted to get him on my podcast, and unfortunately he passed before we could make it happen. But I did have a couple really nice hangout times with him. And, oh, my God. I mean, I'm such a fan of his. So I yeah. know that Joe was also very inventive and stuff. So tell me about their co collaboration in, in terms of creating Hawkman or what you know about uh, Gardner's specific contributions to Hawkman. Well, I mean, it was, it was Gardner Fox that, uh, the, the concept was all his. And he didn't, I, I wouldn't say collaborated with his artists. He largely didn't interact with his artists at all. Um, I, he did think that, you know, he, he described Kubert's art as tops. There you go. <laughs> well, it was. I, I love it. I'm like, that's such a perfect <laughs> encapsulation of the time. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, that's great. Um, he stood up for Murphy Anderson too, though, which sure. I thought was nice. Oh my God! Did they um, did they create Adam Strange? Did he create? Did he co-create Adam Strange? The list of that is 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 huge. I mean, even Jerry Bales, I think, has an argument for for a little bit of of co-creation in there. Um, but that's that's a messy, messy. The sh I, I've I've read a lot about that, and it's hard to pin down. When you mentioned Murphy, who Anderson. all had a yeah. Time. When you mentioned Murphy Anderson, that's what made me think of Adam Strange for a second. And also, I you know obviously Krypton. Oh, I love Adam so, Strange. So, uh, uh, but okay, well, so which is another of, of Gardner Fox's characters, and uh, his favorite actually. Who was his favorite character? Adam Strange. Oh, that's there. You go. Yeah, man. No, I love. I love. Uh, I love Adam Strange, and I loved a lot of his stories writing Adam Strange. The um, so for Hawkman, he's the one who came up with 
the Thanagarian cop, the interplanetary yes. cop. Yes. That's cool. Uh, it, yeah, he really, he wanted to up the John Carter. He wanted to do even more later on. But it, again, with sa- science fiction became kind of one of his, his loves at, at that time. Well, and again, perfect timing because uh, you mm-hmm. know, DC to reinvent the heroes lean more on, yeah. on science fiction and uh, science in general, really. Um, Absolutely. With, with the Atom and also with um, with the Flash being, uh, you know, Barry Allen being a forensic uh, policeman and everything. And, you know, isn't that interesting? You know, well, decades before Quincy and CSI, Barry Allen was there. <laughs> so, yeah. Pretty, although back then, as I always like to say, it was always all about ballistics. Everything... <laughs> It seemed like every. It was. There was a lot. <laughs> Even in the first issue of, of Flash, though, Gardner Fox has this moment where he's like, "Oh, well, he can catch the bullet because he's going the same speed as the bullet." And he, he always drops in the, the scientific information. <laughs> I, I really do. I, I almost see him as as playing a teacher role in his his writing of comics. That's great. And then, unfortunately, in the late sixties, it seemed that was the first time when maybe his writing was considered old hat. And uh, I know yeah. there, there was like a mass, there was a real purge of writers um, from from the DC line uh, back That's then. Definitely a way to to put that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Please describe it for people. Um, I, I mean, I do. I think purge is is perhaps a, a good way of phrasing that. Um, it came down to what became known as the writers' strike. So Gardner Fox, Brome, uh, uh, or no, not Brome. He just left um, because of other reasons. Um, but Finger was a part of it. Um, Arnold Drake yeah. was a part of it. Um, they decided that because they had been with what was now DC for so long and they didn't have any kind of creator's rights, like, they were worried about their futures. And so they came and they, and they also found out that people were getting paid different amounts and, you know, the younger writers were often getting paid more. Um, and he, Gardner Fox thought that just wasn't fair. He didn't think that that was right. And so he, he, he joined them and tried to fight for health insurance, a pension plan, like basic stuff. Sure. And they refused. And in fact, they, they really, Gardner Fox described it as being pushed out. Uh, he w- wasn't allowed to work with Schwartz anymore. Wow. He was put under the editorship of, um, Mort Wessinger, who, you know, yeah, kind of lots of stories about him he, being difficult to work yeah, with. Yeah, no, is, one of the classic jerks yeah. of comics, absolutely, my guy. And that's being kind, yeah. just referring to him as a jerk. No, pretty sadistic <laughs> guy, absolutely. Yeah, and so Gardner Fox was he he couldn't do it, and so he he that's when he decided to retire from comics. Although he did, there were a couple of moments like Schwartz at one point even said, "Hey, like went under the table and had Gardner Fox write a story and got in trouble for it." And like, <laughs> wow. Well, and also he yeah. did do a little work, as we said earlier, at Marvel. I know that yeah. um, he did Tomb of Dracula for a brief period as well. He did. He did. Tomb of Dracula, he did. Doctor Strange, even. In fact, he's wow. the one who set up the uh, Steve Englehart uh, Lovecraftian tilt that looks like it's going to be making it to the movies. So Gardner Fox had his, his tiny little hand on that. <laughs> that's excellent. No, that's cool to hear and, and, and remember. Um, again, this guy had such an impact on comics, and um, I'm glad that um, you know things, things didn't end as sad as it was in terms of him being kicked out of DC as he was and everything that, uh, it sounds like the, well, he left uh, his own vol- volition okay. and, um, the same with Marvel as well. Uh, Roy Thomas flat out said that he would have kept Gardner Fox working, but Gardner Fox didn't like the Marvel method. He thought that it was rather backwards. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> coming up with, coming up with like a, a story plot, giving it to the artist and then getting it. And back then to having it. to do work again after it came back. Sure. He, he, that was not okay with him. And I find that interesting too, because he had worked for other companies before. And so there was something like, like I said, he described it as, as the way Marvel did it was backwards. And so he didn't feel comfortable. And honestly, I think he was just still recovering. Like he felt like he went to the um, New York convention in 71 and he said that he felt like he was 
unwanted in comics, essentially. Wow. Like, that time had, had ended for him. Jeez. Was he... You know, I know um, there were great fanzines in the, yes. in the 60s and stuff. Did Would he interact with fans? Would he respond and, and talk to fans? Oh, absolutely. His That's one of the things in the archives that takes up the most space other than the comics, because he, he was an early comic collector. And that's something I wish I, wow. I had talked a little bit more about in the book, because collecting comics was just not something that was was common at the time sure. um but he he in fact was the, he's the patron saint of comic fandom as Roy Thomas describes him um because he put Jerry Bales and Roy Thomas in communication with each other and he he had the first issue of Alter Ego he was an early subscriber he was a big wow. fan that's a then of course people know tomorrow's Alter Ego now the magazine yeah. that Roy uh, edits but also, yeah, it started off as a fanzine. And, you know, the fanzines is literally when, you know, they had dozens of readers as opposed to thousands <laughs> of readers. And and it was really this great – the the passion that I think people have now with their blogs and podcasts, obviously. I always tell when I talk to Roy or I talk to uh, a guy like Bill Shelley and say, yeah, right. you guys are the forefathers of podcasting, man. I mean, you guys, yeah. you guys were doing it in print, what we're doing now with audio. That's absolutely true. And I love how scholarly they were. Absolutely. Like people really studied it. Yes. We we talk about, you know, high and low culture and, and fandom versus, you know, comic scholar. I'm like, the difference between a comic scholar, quote unquote, and a fan, I find very minute. <laughs> a lot of fans I know have a large, large database of information that they have in their head because they study. I, I agree. I wonder, and Jennifer, forgive me, because I don't want to sound like an old man screaming from his lawn. I sometimes, <laughs> well, and again, the case in point with your book and everything, sometimes um, when I see younger fans, and they are very passionate, and they know their knowledge, but they know their knowledge within their own lifetime. And a lot of times it's like, yes. wow, this yes. is the first, like, I will read a blog. This is the first time that ever happened to Spider-Man. And then one of us older fans will be like, well, actually, you know, uh, Jerry Conway wrote that in the 70s. Yeah. Well, that was before I was born. And it's like, yeah, but it happened. And and I'm guessing the writer might have even been aware that it happened, the yeah. new writer. So, yeah, I, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Well, but that's why. <laughs> I, thank God I've you're been pe- having all those battles for a long time. Really? That, that's one of the things I love about the Internet, though, is now instead of just carrying that information and, like, just having to hope that they believe you, you can show them evidence. <laughs> <laughs> are your sons reading comics? Absolutely. They both, although my, my oldest has lost interest in superheroes largely. He still likes Deadpool a fair amount. Okay. And he's a big Spider Man fan. Um that into the, the multiverse, he loved that movie. Oh, um yeah. but generally he's he's stepped away. I think the only thing he's he's been following now is Paper Girls. He really, really oh, likes that's that. That's great. Oh man. Oh, you know, Cliff Chang, there's nothing wrong with that. That's excellent, Brian Vaughn. Right? Brian K. Vaughn, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I was thinking <laughs> and then Mike youngest he he loves everything um superheroes are one of his favorites Thor is his ultimate favorite everything but he also reads some of the the more targeted um CC Bell is his favorite comic writer I think um an artist um she did um El Defo and uh, El Super Defo and he <laughs> loved that he's read that a few times that's cool that's excellent wow um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm glad to hear that and everything. That's, that's excellent. Um, when, when, so Fox, again, I want to go back to his, uh, you know, Silver Age period, the, uh, well, in the sixties. Yeah. And, um, so you know, again, a voracious writer, was he writing like several titles a month and everything? I mean, we would always know about the big event each year with the multiverse where, okay, you know, crisis on our three, we meet the crime uh, syndicate and, uh, eventually, you know, that even expands further into others, uh, writing into the seventies, obviously, but yeah. so was it just the three? Was it crisis? No, he two? was reading or he was writing nonstop during that. Um, for instance, he, uh, did the million dollar debut of Batgirl. Oh, that's um, he great. did all of the Zatanna. Um, and of course you already mentioned Green Lantern. And he was doing Hal Jordan Green Lantern as well in the sixties. Yes. That's cool. No, that's excellent. Wow, and I and I had forgotten that. Yeah, he, so he wrote the million dollar debut of Batgirl, and my God, what a splash yep. that made! So yeah, and I I 
makes the argument on that one that he looked to his sister for inspiration. His sister was a librarian, head librarian of, of uh, the Keene uh, Public Library, and she made such an impact on the community. They literally named a wing of the library after her. Wow. That's really – that's amazing. And also, again, the creation of Batgirl and, I mean, its importance and – it you know uh, which which came first? Did the TV show want to do Batgirl, and they went to the comics, or it actually came from the TV show? I they, so. so after ratings started to slip, they approached Schwartz and was like, "Hey, we want this character. We want a female character for girls to uh, to look up to." They they very specifically were looking for that, and so they they brought that back, and um, that's where Batgirl came from. Wow, and Yvonne Craig was perfect. She really was. Yeah. My God. She was. Yeah. No, I'm a big <laughs> fan. And you know, did you ever read in the 70s, um, I used to love when they would team up Batgirl with Robin. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, and she was a congresswoman, Barbara Gordon became, you know. that's yeah. There's a forgotten little, like, element of Barbara Gordon that they've, they've never, you know, gone back to it all. It was her time as a, in Congress and everything, which is pretty amazing. It's very cool, yeah. Absolutely. And again, I, I, she's so inspirational, and and that's that's one of the things that I think makes it so obvious. You know, like um, his sister was very big into uh, historical preservation, so it's one of those you can just you can just see the importance of of that type of of that kind of strong woman, I guess. That's cool, and you know, I, again, reading your introduction. Um, you mentioned that during the 40s, um, the role that Wonder Woman had in the Justice Society was yeah. something that, you know, obviously rubs fem- feminists the wrong way. So, yeah, what, what can you tell us about that? I want people to read the book, but I mean, I'm interested in whatever you can share now. Well, I, uh, the Wonder Woman bit is near and dear to my heart because it was actually started from my master's thesis. Um, and it... I, I was basically thinking about what is the thing that's going to be the hardest sell? What is it that people would not agree with that he did? Mm-hmm. And I mean, we, even in the, the movie recently, we had that throwaway line about how, you know, the secretary is basically a slave. Um, and in which, in which I, movie, I want, in which movie, help me. The Wonder Woman movie. Oh, I didn't remember that line, but go ahead. There you go. Well, shame yeah, it was me. a throwaway because she asks, what's a secretary? Ah. She, uh, yeah, and so that we get those moments where, <laughs> yeah, that's seen as a very, very sexist moment in, in comic history to take that powerful yeah. character and just make her sit on the sidelines. That's true, yeah. Um, but one, that really wasn't his decision. Okay. <laughs> And two, I think that there's enough room for uh, we can empathize with her in a lot of ways. I think that the way that Gardner Fox uses female characters in that time was as an audience viewpoint. So we are from her perspective in the introductions and conclusions because she's essentially the Greek chorus. Mm. You know, she's the one saying, oh, this is so exciting. I wish I could go with you and then come back and do the recap and and all of that. And I think it paves the way, too, for her to be that keeper of of history. You know, she she does the the scrapbook later. She becomes a published author later on. And so I, I think to demean her for being a secretary or demean that role is is a misstep in general. I, I think that there was something empowering about that, especially if you look at it from a historical standpoint at that time, women going into secretarial work, that was a big deal. They were getting independence. They were. And, and so I, I really, I called the whole thing into question while also making it clear that, you know, that wasn't necessarily uh, something that Gardner Fox may have wanted to do, but I think he handled it very well. Do you know who his um, editor was back in the uh, golden age like that? For what for, specifically? Well, I guess for Justice Society or, uh, you know, the All-American line. I don't know if he had more than Sheldon one. Sheldon Mayer. Oh, That's Shelley Mayer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, honestly, and it's. I just had this, this conversation with another guest a couple of days ago. We were talking about Star Trek. And, mm-hmm. hey, Jim Roddenberry was a casting couch producer. There's no, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. That said, 
he did put a female black woman in, you know, a, a, a yeah. command role. And in the original pilot, all the women are wearing pants. And it was NBC that said, yeah, put them in miniskirts. You know, I mean, it's... Oh, I didn't know that. It, that's very cool. Yeah, I mean, and that's... And honestly, because I, I really think, again, that there's a lot of... Um, well, sometimes I think in the worst cases, it's I call it retro shaming. But also, I do think that yeah. there's a there is a woke perspective about the past, and there's a lot of tongue clucking and... You know, you shouldn't have done that. And it's yeah. like, yeah. yeah, but, you know, given the, uh, you know, zeitgeist of the time, Roddenberry was a pretty forward thinker and saying, no, we're going to have a multiracial cast on our, our show. And uh, hell, at the height of the space race, yeah, the Russians belong there, too. Of course they do. I mean, and, yeah. you know, and, and not to mention the women. Uh, so, it, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I that's that's cool. No, again, you know, honestly, I'm looking forward to reading this book. And I have a feeling... Um, I will be asking you to come back and, uh, you know, go more into detail of some of the stuff that. That would be fun. No, no, I'm really, I'm, really, I'm looking forward to uh, to reading it. When when is the release date for the book? Oh, it's out already. Oh, it is, oh forgive me, I didn't. Yeah. See, I didn't see, shame on me. For for a, a few weeks now. Okay, that's great to hear. I um, here I've got it. Uh, I want to bring it up because I got the cover here. There we go. Forgotten All Star: A Biography of Gardner Fox, and it's. Uh, I'm sorry, what is the publisher again is Paul Piero Press. Paul Piero Press. Absolutely, there you go. So, and I'm assuming, obviously, it's on Amazon, it's at the Paul Piero Press website. Do you have your own website that you want to direct people to? Um, it, just go to my Twitter, at Jennifer DeRoss. I, I tend to put announcements and updates, and I, I still like to post little random Gardner Fox factoids as I come across the, the need to. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's great. And uh, are, do you have... Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, you quote a lot of letters and things. Do you have photos of any letters or artifacts and photos of Fox and everything all over the place in the book? Oh, yeah. Cool. I In fact, that's one of the things that I really wanted to do was make this a stepping stone for more research. So I tried to include um, bits of information that are, you know, like – necessarily i i don't know like i've got um for instance his um writing schedule i've got a page oh. of his writing schedule in there and i've got a page of his scrapbook and i i really i wanted to make it feel almost like you're doing the research alongside me so to speak <laughs> that's cool no that's excellent do you are do you think you'll be uh tackling more comic creator subjects for any uh, future books I'm definitely thinking about it. Um, I'm not sure what my, my next step is. I've decided, I mean, I, I, it took me four years to write that, but I also was getting my master's and a certificate in teaching and getting a job and, and writing other things. And, and I've, I literally had a few days, like a handful of days off a year. Um, for those four years. So I'm, I'm going to take a month off before I, I get too excited and think too much. Cause as soon as I have another project, I know I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> You'd be doing any conventions. Uh, we were talking off the air. Um, but yeah, any, any convention plans to promote the book? Uh, there, there are some tentative plans for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't want to make any announcements yet, no but I'm excited about that. Okay, great. Well, yeah, no, I, I'll be, I follow you on Twitter. So I'll be looking forward to seeing what, uh, what announcements you make, and uh, yeah, believe me, I'm going to sit down and read this book and uh, get back to you. I, uh, I I think it's a great subject, and again, I th- uh, your title says it all. Forgotten All Star, he absolutely was, and uh, thankfully, mm-hmm. people like yourself are going to make sure that that doesn't uh, his his life and his contributions to comics don't go unnoticed. So, congratulations! Yeah. No, it's a great subject, yeah. and I uh, and uh, like I said, no, the uh, what you sent me certainly has me intrigued to to read more of the book. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, checking it out, and I recommend it to my audience. So, Jennifer DeRoss, thank you for your uh, your work in this subject and uh, the conversation today. Thank you very much. It really was my pleasure. That's Jennifer DeRoss. You'll want to check out her book, Forgotten All-Star, a biography of Gardner Fox. Uh, the book is out. 
and available now. Uh, it's there at Amazon, among other places. You should definitely check it out. It's a pretty cool book, and I look forward to uh, having Jennifer back to talk more about the life and career of Gardner Fox. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Ford Balloon. It was brought to you by the League of Ford Balloon listeners via Patreon. Ford Balloon is free, but if you want to help out the cause, do you think uh, the content here at Ford Balloon is it worth a dollar a month to you? Is it worth the price of a comic book? I hope so. I try to bring uh, interesting conversations every week here at wordballoon.com, and I do it with your help via Patreon. To subscribe, you can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon or click on the Patreon ad on the front page of wordballoon.com. Thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics, who are having a great 2019 of incredible books that uh, come out every month from great creators, people like Tim Seeley and Chris Sabella and Garth Ennis and Marguerite Bennett and uh, books like uh, You Are Obsolete from Matthew Clickstein and Trust Fall from Chris Sabella, Dark Red from my buddy Tim Seeley, among others. Really neat stuff. Great genre-bending books that deserve your attention. Go to their website. You will find great stories, full preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AfterShockComics.com. Thanks again for listening, League of Word Balloon listeners. I am here at Rose City. I will uh, be uh, bringing you some content from uh, this week I'm spending here in Portland, and uh, I hope you will enjoy it. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoy the other great output that I'm giving you here at WordBalloon.com. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.